This is very, uh, okay, so I'm gonna do my official start, everyone. Don't you love that? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Spring Vegetable Gardening. I'm Ann Shellman, the program coordinator for the UCCE Stanislaus County Master Gardeners. Thank you for joining us tonight. You can see we have a little disclaimer here about how to operate everything. Um, and we are excited to see folks here. And uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about our program before we get started. The purpose of the Master Gardener program is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices. And you can see here, one of our Master Gardeners is talking to a client she could be identifying a weed for her or talking about a pest. So we do have office hours. So you could be on here from anywhere in California. And if that's the case, uh, you can contact your local Master Gardener office. And if you're not sure how to do that, you can always contact us uh, for local solutions to problems. And we always want to uh, recommend the least or less toxic solutions, such as a horticultural soap or an oil. And these are products that are already formulated that you can purchase. They are not the same as mixing something up in your kitchen, which we really don't recommend. We recommend that you go with something that's already been formulated. And at the end of this presentation, we'll talk about the UCIPM website where you can get more help. And if you are not already following us on social media, we hope you will Check out our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and also our YouTube where this video will be posted. You can see we've got lots of different types of videos here and uh, something for everybody, I hope. And now we're gonna go ahead and get started with spring vegetable gardening. And I will let our hosts for the evening, our speakers, Ted and Ro, take it away. Go ahead, Ro. Well, you're going to say who you are? Yes, my name is Ted Hawkins from uh, Stanislaus County 19, 2019 class, along with Ro. Yes, and I'm Ro Yer. Um, I think I'll start with a little story. It's not on the script, so it's just lots of fun. Uh, spring vegetable gardening where when I grew up was just so exciting because the land would be frozen. And so you didn't do any, any winter gardening like you can in Stanislaus County. Um, and I remember the catalogs coming to the house and my mother and father reading them and marking them and what seeds they were going to. This was starting in January, this was a big opportunity. And then of course they couldn't actually start planting probably until April or May, but um, we are so fortunate, of course, today in Stanislaus County, it was pretty cold, but normally um, we can start our gardening. And in fact, many people have started their gardening inside already. So spring is a wonderful time. And let's talk about what we're going to go over this evening, today. Okay, gardening basics, planting methods, popular vegetables, harvest and storage, pests and solutions, of course, your questions all along the way. Okay, gardening basics. All right, you need to have sun and water for vegetable gardening. Six to eight hours for most of our plants. Um, we also know that in Stanislaus County, the summers are very, very hot and a lot of sun. So there's some vegetables that will not grow well once we hit the June, July time. Um, have water source nearby. It's best to have it set up in your garden is my feeling. I like soaker hoses and I have my soaker hose on a timer. So I know that if I'm gone for several days or even if I forget to get outside, the soaker hose will go on when it's set. Okay, we're gonna prepare the soil. Gonna add some compost to your garden, mix it in. Um, if you're going to do container gardening, which is a wonderful way to also experience spring and summer gardening, make certain you use a good quality potting mix. Um, don't use soil from the garden. It maybe have pests in it, seeds in it, um, and it's very heavy. It's a little bit hard to move those containers around. Uh, watering it, make sure your seeds and seedlings and transplants get enough water. Uh, keep the soil moist. 
that's the root ball. And we're going to talk about that kind of stuff. A lot of you know this stuff, but we're just going to kind of review it because Maybe you didn't have a winter garden and it's time to, to shake off the winter and start with the spring. And you wanna water regularly. Now there are a couple of things we'll look at about if you're watering too much or too little, but you'll be able to tell vegetables are pretty demanding. When they want water, they let you know. Fertilizing, um, if you're going to be fertilizing and usually the best thing is you wait several weeks after you put your garden in because you put the compost in, you've got everything worked real well. Um, but look at the instructions. These commercial fertilizers are formulated and regulated and experts put the information together. And if it says use you know, a quarter of a teaspoon, use a quarter of a teaspoon. Don't do the Dorothy Yare, that's my mother's thing of a little bit is good, a lot's gotta be better. So do what it says so that you don't burn or hurt your, your uh, vegetable plants. Uh, water soluble fertilizer, and it'll say on the label, if you're not quite certain, go to your, your local nursery and ask them, I want whatever you want, a, just a, a good basic fertilizer. Um, one of the things that, that you don't really need once you put your compost in is you don't have to put any amendments in the soil, in the, in the holes when you dig. So a good fertilizer a few few weeks down the uh, down the pike and your 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 uh, your garden's going to be great. Okay, any questions out there, Ted? I don't see any. Okay, any. so everyone's still hanging in there. Okay, now we're going to talk about container gardening. Uh, any type of container, plastic, metal, wood, they all work very well. As long as there's a hole in the bottom that you uh, need to drill if it's missing because the water needs to get out of the container. Larger containers are best if you're, you know, if you're planting large things like tomatoes and stuff like that, you need a large container because they will bind up the roots and they not grow very well. When reusing uh, containers, you want to clean them with 10% bleach water solution. So that means 10% of the solution is bleach and water is the other 90%. And that way it'll get rid of any of the uh, soil pests and stuff like that might be in the pot that was used before. Containers, there's a couple of problems with containers. They're heavy. or they can be heavy. And if they are, you need to get a, a trolley or something underneath them whenever you get ready to plant so that you can move them around. Uh, if they're on your patio or your porch, you might uh, get stains from the water that runs through and, and leaches out of the soil, out of the potting soil. And uh, you need to put a saucer underneath it to catch any water so that it doesn't uh, stain your porch or patio. You do not want to have uh, water sitting in the contain uh, the saucers that's underneath because you might attract some mosquitoes and other insects that are bad for your plants. You can use containers like wheelbarrows and uh, kitty litter bins and all those kind of things, five gallon buckets. Rubber, rubber made uh, tubs and kiddie pools and all those kind of things. Milk jugs are good for, you know, smaller plants that you might need, uh, might want to grow. Uh, you want to try to avoid railroad tire, railroad ties and uh, tires because they have chemicals in there that are not good for your plants. The maximum, or excuse me, minimum size container for vegetables. Most pots need to hold at least two gallons for beets, cucumbers, radishes, cherry tomatoes, and green beans and, and those kind of vegetables. Pots that are, that are five gallons or bigger would be for determinate tomatoes, squash, eggplant, and mini pumpkins. 
larger pumpkins, not the mini size, probably would not be grown in a five gallon pot or any kind of pot because they're, they take up too much room. Yeah, I just noticed something I hadn't noticed before, Ted and Roe. Sometimes cherry tomatoes can be indeterminate and get very That's large. So I think I'm gonna have to change this slide. I think with that, uh, pretty much all tomatoes should be grown in at least five gallons. Yes, I, I agree. Got it. Uh, some plants require, a lot of plants require plant supports. Uh, that's things from vining forms, need trellises, uh, beans, cucumbers, uh, the mini pumpkins and the squash, all need some kind of a support like a, a trellis. As you can see on their screen on the right hand side, that's a um, trellis made out of sticks and uh, rope binding twine. The ones on the uh, left hand side, there's either a tomato cage or bamboo sticks to make those type of supports. Containers, when, when you have containers, you need to water them frequently because the, uh, the container will dry out, especially when it gets like uh, Ro was saying early, California has hot, hot temperatures. So therefore, whenever they uh, gets hot, they will dry out quicker than uh, most plants that are buried in the ground. So you wanna test the moisture with your fingers, stick it a few inches deep, and if there's water needed, you should be able to have no dirt stick to your finger. And if not, if it does stick to your finger, you're probably fine. Daily check your, for watering needs on, like I said, on the warm, warm weathers and check the plants two or times, two or three times a day, maybe if, if it's really, really hot. Uh, some plant, plants, like I said, needs more space than should, uh, they should not be planted in pots. They should be planted in the ground. Artichokes grow huge. They ever grow to three or four feet across. Pumpkins take up, you know, a lot of room because the uh, vines grow very large. Melons, uh, winter squash, those are the hard squash like uh, banana squash and, and those kind of things that are, those are the winter squashes. And the indeterminate tomatoes. Indeterminate means they keep growing until they reach the sky almost. They, uh, there's no stopping them from growing. So they need to have plenty of room. And corn needs to be grown in rows because the wind pollinates the corn and the corn, the tassels on one stalk gets the pollen from the one next to it. So you need to have them in rows. Okay, um, we have a, a comment and a question. We'll start with the chat comment. Um, okay, uh, Pam said, Pamela says, if soil from the garden is bad for containers, as it might contain pest and disease, why is it not so bad for ground beds? Well, you've got a larger area. Um, and hopefully you have, you're, you're, you're mixing the soil around. When you've got it in a pot, it kind of, uh, it, it limits. I think the other thing too is just in case you have things in the soil already, then you're yeah. making more problems in a, in a pot. But one of the real problems is that you're, the soil in the pot, uh, you're watering it and watering it, and eventually it can get really compacted and it may be harder to garden in that pot. Okay, and Tammy says, what does determinant mean? Uh, Ted, you want to repeat that again? You determinant just means they grow to a certain specific height. And indeterminate means they grow continuously. They will put on fruit. Most determinant tomatoes will have a crop that is all pretty much all ripe at one time. Whereas the, the indeterminate keeps growing and every time it puts out a new sucker or whatever, it'll put new flowers and it'll keep growing. So that's the difference between determinate and indeterminate. Okay. And we have a chat. Let's see. Um, 
What do you add? Okay. Uh, what do you add to the ground soil if you want to plant there, there and versus a raised bed? What do you add to the ground soil if you want to plant there? I think that's just your compost. Right. And it looked like Yesenia had a question about where to get compost, which of course depends on where you live. Mm -hmm. If you're in our area, I heard from the recycling coordinator that at some point uh, Mogro or Modesto compost would be free and it's going to be available bagged where you can just pick it up. But I don't know where and when that's going to happen. There's also the um, Jennings Road compost facility. Uh, but uh, Yesenia, if you don't live around here, you would get that at any garden or nursery center, or you can take our online composting class that we did uh, not that long ago with Heidi. Um, and there might've been one other host and uh, make your own. And and speaking of Heidi, it looks like she was just also commenting on Ted as far as the determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. So um, the when what Ted, when he was saying they kind of stop, it's like the Roma at, at a certain point, they're just done and you get them all at one time. And so what's kind of cool about that is that's the basis for ketchup and tomato paste because out in a, um, field where farmers are growing lots and lots of tomatoes to make ketchup. It's all the tomatoes are ripe, ready at the same time. They go to the processing plant. We as home gardeners prefer a lot more the indeterminate tomatoes because you're going to get them and then they're going to keep coming and coming. And I've had tomatoes through October or November, depending on uh, when the frost hits. And okay. sorry. Go ahead. I just said, hopefully that's answered all the questions, Ro. Did we miss anything? We've got one more. How do I prepare the soil for raised beds? Says, asked Deanna. Ooh, that's a good question. It is. And I was just, uh, we just answered a question about that on the Master Gardener helpline. Let's see if I can remember the answer. It, the answer is a third of the um, soil would be your regular garden soil. Another third would be potting soil and another third would be compost. So we have a, I'll, and we'll send it to everybody. We have a great guide called the um, Vegetable Gardening Basics where it mentions how to build up the soil in your raised beds. Oh, good. Okay, Vegetable Garden, we'll look we'll, we'll type looking that for that one. And okay, did we get one more question come flying in? Okay. Uh, Christy says, is there some reasons I'm not getting fruit or vegetables to set? We're going to talk about that. Hang in there, Christy. Great See if we question. answer it. And Deanna, thank you. I appreciate the, the thank you, Deanna. And let me see if there's one more chat. Don't want to miss anyone. Um, okay, Yesenia is from the area, so we're, we're answering her. Um, okay, Yvonne, I'm not understanding her light. Okay. Um, and do you, would you add, would you add perlite to a, a? It's it wasn't recommended in the um, publication that we have from the university. Uh, perlite is more of a starting medium for seeds and you know getting your stuff started. Ted, have you used it in other ways? Not in a garden situation. Plants. It it absorbs moisture so that your pots that you're trying to start your seeds in has plenty of moisture, but I, I, I don't know that I would add it to a raised bed. I, I, that, that would not be necessary, I don't think. Okay. All right, I think, think, think we're just about, you're welcome. I think we have one more question about grubs in really? raised beds. I think, sorry, I don't know if you're in our area, but we probably need to identify these grubs. Oh, there we go. Can I still um, without? Sorry, are you, you can go ahead and message us if they are in our, if you're in our area, I would love to see these grubs. You could bring them to the office. Uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead. I will privately message you, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, I will, we'll go ahead and continue here. Thank you so much for your, your, your questions and your comments. That, that helps a lot. Um, okay, we're going to talk about planting methods. Two ways, transplants and seeds. 
Um, there are benefits and deterrents to both. So we're gonna talk a little bit. A transplant is simply a plant that has already been started. Um, you can find them at uh, your uh, big box store, at your nursery. Um, sometimes farmer's market will have that type of thing. They're very good, especially if the first time. Transplants can also be started from seeds in your house, you know, in your yard, in your, your but so that you can, um, you can actually start your own transplants. But I think what we're talking about here are a little bit older and the ones that come from the garden. So let's uh, real quickly, let's take a poll. And how do you start your vegetables? Are you a seed person? Do you buy your transplants or do you do both? A little, a little music to think about. And you need to hum a little bit. So. <laughs> I was just uh, looking and it says that I started the poll, but I know I'm not seeing anybody well, voting. Well, we're getting answers. We're getting what answers. What happened? Are we? Yeah. In the chat. In the chat. Both. Oh, seeds good, most because... of the time. Transplants, mostly sometimes seeds. Heidi, seeds. Right. Started with transplants last year, trying seeds. Okay. Um, was that Alexandra? I'm sorry. I'm look, Al Alexandra is, is growing, spreading her wings. Okay. Right. Great. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the good and the bad of both of those things. Seeds versus transplants. Okay. Um, transplant seeds, leafy vegetables, you know, your, uh, kales and your lettuces, uh, squash, pumpkins, cucumber. Those are real easy because the seeds are huge. And I always find that I lose the seeds when I'm starting to put it and I don't know if I've got one in that little egg container or whatever. So this makes it very simple if you're not as organized, if you're like me. Uh, transplants, that's for little tiny seeds. You gotta be patient, but it can be done also. But it's really good for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Now, the only problem with tomatoes from a transplant is you're limited. And there are so many varieties of tomatoes. So, you know, maybe if you're new to gardening, maybe the first year or two, you want to do transplants. But then think about spreading your wings and maybe trying a different kind of heirloom starting from seeds. Um, there are just so many varieties that you cannot get already started. And that would be a wonderful way to also, you know, extend your, your garden. Oh, just something to think about. Uh, planning methods. Okay, four to six weeks old for your, or a little bit older. Now, when you go to the big box store and you take that, that either six pack or that little four ounce tomato plant, um, it's probably more than four or six weeks old. And you'll be able to, we'll talk about that when we, we, we get to actually pulling it out of the container. So, um, but they're a little bit older. Um, you plant, they can quickly it'll establish your garden. You can see exactly where things are. Sometimes with seeds, if you plant them directly in the garden and you don't do them in like a little transplant cup, I've lost seeds before. And all of a sudden something comes up and I think, oh, what's that? Hmm, didn't know I had something growing there. Um, there are lots of transplants available and they're very easy to work with. So, um, Seeds are very inexpensive, pros and cons. Uh, a package of seeds, you can either split with someone, put away, and we're gonna talk later about how long you can keep some seeds. So it's not going to, it's like, you know, you, you say, oh my gosh, that costs X amount of dollars or whatever it is. It'll last a while and you'll have so many seeds. And maybe you and some neighbors or gardening friends, you can exchange seeds. I'm going to buy uh, a package of, uh, zebras this year and I'll give you some of my zebra seeds if you give me some of your brandy wine or whatever it is okay this kind of reminds me of Heidi's talk tips mm -hmm. for terrific tomatoes where she planted an entire seed packet and <laughs> afterwards realized this is way too many tomatoes but then she couldn't bring herself to not grow them so she grew so many tomatoes <laughs> Start her own canning company. Yes. Basically. Okay. Planning transplants. Okay. This we talked about earlier. Very easy 
even though there are maybe six weeks, eight weeks old, they're still tender, especially between the stem and where the root ball is, the part that's in the container, ease it out. Um, sometimes if it's a soft plastic, if like a six pack, you can kind of squeeze the bottom, maybe use um, a, a spoon or my favorite's an ice cream stick because then you can eat the ice cream first and then use the ice cream stick to pull it out. Um, if you look at the roots and see that it's either they're out of the bottom or they're circling around, kind of ease them apart. It's not going to hurt it if you're gentle with them. And then you make a hole in your garden where you want to plant it. Um, make the hole a little bigger than, or about the same size, about the same depth. And you're going to set the plant in there. You're going to fill around there easily. Um, you're going to be very careful you don't go over the top. So in other words, it's got to be the same level as the top of your little plant. And you're going to water it well. And if you're growing something that needs support, put your support on then. And that way you don't have to fight with uh, losing. I only say that because I have done this, okay? You don't lose you know, pieces of your, your plant or you don't worry about having to get them all together and work together. So put your, your uh, support in immediately. And like Ted said, you can make supports, you can buy supports. Um, some people just use a plain stick and they tie it on with uh, pieces of, of you know, soft string or rag or something like that. Okay, now what is a seed? A seed is a tiny embryo covered by a protective seed coat. And what you're doing when you put it in the ground, you're going to get rid of that protective coat and let that little, little embryo inside it's, it has its food and it's going to start growing. And some have a thicker covering than others. If you look at, I'm sure maybe all of you have had like a sunflower seed or a, a pumpkin seed. And you see how thick that is when you have to crack it open when you're eating them. Okay, that has to be softened up so that the little seed inside can start growing. But there's food in there, it's protected. And this is how the little plant starts germinating. Um, in the ground. Now, another thing, and I don't know if we, I don't, actually, I don't remember, putting things in the ground. Yes, our ground doesn't freeze in Stanislaus County, but if it's too cold, the plants aren't going to grow anyway. And I think 60 degrees, isn't that the temperature they usually recommend that the ground be in 60, Ted? Yes. Okay. So you figure it's going to take a while for, the, for our ground to hit 60 because at night it cools off and everything else. Um, I've known people who have, have been, you know, I've, I've got my plants in first. Well, that's fine, but their plants are gonna sit there. So don't worry about, I'm too late right now, you're not. You're gonna be able to get them in and have a really good garden. Okay, then you can see there's a, isn't that a great picture of a sprouted seed? The little root hairs are going to grow. And then of course, They'll go into the soil. They'll take water and nutrients from the soil. And then, what is that one? Is that a radish? I don't really know. Is it a radish, Anne? Could be. Okay. It's okay. Anybody's okay. guess. So anyway, you'll have a little radish someday. That's exciting. Keep it moist. It's fragile. Be careful. That's why if you, if you possibly can, many of the seeds, especially the little one, start it in a, an egg carton is a great place and you can scoop that out. And then you can just put that in the ground when everything, when it gets a little bit stronger, a little bit bigger, and the ground gets a little bit warmer. And then the seed packet, again, these are designed and written by experts. Read it, it's very important. Um, it'll give you instructions on uh, how, de how deep should I bury this? You know, an eighth of an inch is this package. That's, that's just like a sprinkling on top. If you put it too deep, the plant may not be able to force its way up to the sunlight. And that might be one reason why you didn't get any seeds that year. How far apart you should plant them? If it says 12 inches and you're doing, doing large seeds, that's pretty easy. But with small seeds like lettuce, that's kind of difficult. So that's when you come around and you have to start um, taking out some of the seeds. And some people just can't do that. They hate to do that, the thinning. Um, how far apart should you put the rows? Um, how long should it take to sprout? So that when you put that in, put a date when you put it in the ground 
and see, should I, my sprout should be there seven to 14 days. If I don't, nothing sprouted in seven to 14 days, maybe there's some, maybe I need to do a seed test. Maybe I need to get another package of seeds. So a lot of good information on the seed packet. Okay, it looks like it's time for another poll. This sure one says, is. okay. This one says three on my book. Let's Are see if it's going to work. I I'm launched good. it. Okay. Ta -da. Go ahead and read them, Ted. Has, Ed, has this ever happened to you? Planted seeds that never came up. Planted seeds that sprouted and died. Mm -hmm. Planted seeds that sprouted and appeared to be cut off. Oh. Or planted seeds and pretty sure something ate them, but what? We don't know. Yep. If if you'll just you can take this quiz, click on each one that did you have happened to you. Looks like we're getting quite a few people voting. I'm gonna give folks a couple more seconds. I'm gonna end the poll and let's share the results. It looks like 94% of people <laughs> planted seeds that never came up. I know I'm in that. Yes. Uh, I remember as a kid digging with a shovel. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I buried some treasure that uh, definitely <laughs> did not come up. Didn't read the, the label. Planted seeds that sprouted and died 75% of people. 44% of people planted seeds that sprouted and appeared to be cut off. And 56% of people planted seeds and pretty sure something ate them, but they don't know what it was. So it sounds like uh, we've got some experiences here that everybody has had. Okay, so if, if your answer was that you didn't have seeds come up, you might have buried them too deep. Like uh, Ro was saying, it, it takes quite a bit of energy for this little embryo to crawl up through the dirt to get to the sun. So if you planted it too deep, it may run out of energy before it gets to the top. So that would be one reason that uh, the seed did not come up. Another reason might be that you didn't water it consistently because they need the moisture to keep the so uh, to draw out of the soil the moisture to, to keep this plant growing. So if it wasn't watered consistently and turned dry, then that would kill the, pl the plant, the embryo that was trying to grow into a full grown plant. Uh, seeds expired due to incorrect storage. Now this one here, I know they've dug up seeds from the pyramids and wherever and found them to be viable, but a lot of seeds, if you don't plant them correct, I mean, store them correctly. If you keep them in a moist place, they get moist, then they get dry and then they, will no longer grow. So you have to keep them in a dry spot uh, out of the sunlight, usually in a the envelope they come in or a or a letter envelope or something that you can store them so that they will continue to have a longer uh, time that they can be in storage. Yeah, one thing we didn't mention was the age of seeds. So a lot of seeds can live in their little packets for a couple of years. And then uh, personally, I just planted some radishes out of just for kicks from 2013. None of them <laughs> came up. So <laughs> I tried, but uh, the ones that were from 2019 all came up. So there you go. You never know. Right. Okay, so if anybody answered the question that their seedlings died, there may be a disease, you may have had a disease called damping off disease that kills them. Uh, what if you can see in the picture on your right hand side, that one there is is dying off from a damping disease. Uh, it, you prevent this by using clean potting mixture and containers because the disease in the old pot may continue to do it's damage in the next time you use it. So whenever, like I said earlier, when you're use, reusing containers, clean them with a 10% bleach water solution, and that will help get rid of the damping disease. You might also have had uh, cutworms, snails, 
or slugs or earwigs, all those insects will eat the new plants. And the picture on your right hand side is a picture of a cutworm. So, you know, those things can cause the plants to be eaten or the cutworms will just cut them off and they fall over and you see a dead plant there. Here's some life expectancies like Ann was saying on certain kinds of seeds. Uh, things like chives, marjoram, onions, oregano, parsley, parsnips, and salsify all have about a one year life expectancy. So if you have them for longer than a year, if it says on your package 2021, you're probably okay. But if it says something longer than that, all you can do is try them. Like Ann said, if she planted 2013 and none of them came up, but if she had planted 2015, maybe half of them would come up. So, you know, you just try, see what you think. Annual flowers, cilantro, leeks, uh, okra, Mizuna, wild, most wildflowers, uh, peppers, sage, and, and sweet corn all have at least a two-year life expectancy in pro if properly stored. Uh, three years, plants like amaranth, lima beans, carrots, celery, Chinese cabbage, fennel, kohlrabi, pea, perennial flower, snap beans, spinach, and tomatillos all will last at least up to three years. Four years are things like beets and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. If you've seen those three seeds, you'll see that they're, they look like a little crusty piece of wood, so to speak. So they have a lot of protection on the outside. Uh, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, eggplants, kale, pumpkins, radishes, rutabaga, squash, Swiss chard, tomatoes, turnips, and watermelons all have about a four-year life expectancy. Things like artichokes, basil, cucumbers, dill, endive, greens, lettuce, and tomato, I mean melons, excuse me, all have about a five-year life expectancy if properly stored. Whenever you plant your plants, seeds, whichever it is, you, you go, you want to plant, uh, make sure they're labeled because like uh, Ro was saying she lost a seed and all of a sudden something come or something came up in her garden. She didn't know what it was. Well, in this case, your best bet is to label the row. That'll show you when you get ready to go start pulling weeds that you're not pulling the row of lettuce or whatever it happens to be. And you can purchase labels. You can repurpose mini blinds. Uh, mini blinds come in either plastic or they used to come in aluminum, but you, you can have them either way. Uh, popsicle sticks, uh, paint sticks, the ones that you stir paint in paint cans with, uh, milk carton strips. You can take strips of milk cartons and cut them into strips that you can use. And you want to use a permanent marker to label these. So like I said, you can remember or at least see what it was that you planted. You want to give seedling space. We were talking earlier about time to thin. Once they, you, if it says plants should be 12 inches apart and you have more seeds than that, you want to thin them out to give them space. You want to thin about three weeks after sprouting. You pinch or cut off the weakest or unwanted plants. If you have two that look exactly the same and there's more room on the left than there is on the right, you want to take the right one out, that kind of thing. And you can add these scraps to your salad or sandwiches. If you have uh, carrots or lettuce, all of those things can be, and even radish leaves, those can be all used in a salad or a sandwich. You know, I was at a friend's house some years ago and she made a basil sauce. Well, I thought it was a basil sauce, it was pesto. But when I got done eating it, she said, guess what you just ate? And I said, uh, Pesto? <laughs> she said, yes, but I use the tops of carrots as the herb, and she flavored it with lemon, and I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. So, pretty cool. <laughs> yep. Very definitely. Okay, here's a thin, uh, an example of thinning your plants. As you can see, there's 
two or three together and then there'll be one. So what you want to do is you want to pull out, there you go, you want to take out enough that you've got enough room in between them that each one of those plants is not fighting for, for their uh, nutrients and stuff, okay. for the two that's next to it. Plus if it's a larger plant, like a beet or a, you know something that grows large, and then you have plenty of room for it to expand to its size it wants to be. Yes, after I eventually planted seeds that did come up, I did not thin them. And <laughs> as an eight-year-old, I could not understand why all my radishes were to so tiny. <laughs> they were all Funny squished shape. together. <laughs> Thinning, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't want to kill them. You work so hard. <laughs> okay, we had a real interesting question, Ted, I thought. Um, it, was a ch it was in the chat. Uh, let me go back to that. Christy will get to you, I promise. Um, Kenneth said he planted tomato and pepper seeds in small containers. I planted them the same depth according to the instructions. Excellent. And the tomatoes sprouted, but not the peppers. Any thoughts? Well, my first thought is check the viability of your pepper seeds. And that's simply you know, putting the seed on a wet paper towel and keeping it dampened and see if it, if they will sprout. Um, you know, how old were they? There's another one. Um, look, look at the, the, the year on the package. It maybe it sat in the store uh, too long, not the best conditions. You know, they just uh, moved the display case into a storeroom and brought it back out. Any other thoughts, Ted or Ann? Well, it my thoughts would be if it was in a shaded spot, one of the plants, the tomatoes were in the sun or wherever, where they got plenty of warmth and, you know, the correct amount of moisture and all that kind of stuff. And the other one was in the, sh the shadows of your kitchen or wherever it was, it didn't get direct sunlight or enough sunlight or enough water. So that, and like Heidi has just said, if you use a heat mat, then all of them get the same amount of temperature. So therefore heat mats are good for starting seeds. Yeah. I think another question would be when he says he, when Kenneth says he did all of this, when was that? Was, yeah. Did he do this inside? Yes. Um, lots of different factors. So this is why it's good to call your local master gardeners and then you can go over all of your steps and try to figure out what might have gone wrong. But everything Ro and Ted said, very good. Oh, and um, Heidi had messaged earlier, I don't know if you guys saw this, but she planted, when she planted all those tomato plants, she planted 450. <laughs> she kept <laughs> all that. of them. So if you have not seen her Tips for Terrific Tomatoes video, you've got to watch it. Excellent. Yes, they're very good. Okay, so let's talk about some popular warm season vegetables. And this is the most exciting part because everybody who you talk to is going to grow. What's the number one summer crop? Even if you have nothing more than a spot on your balcony, tomatoes. And, but there's lots of them. Uh, melons, if you have the space, and let me tell you, melons will run forever. Uh, lettuce and chard, early season. Remember, it gets hot around here, and they don't like our hot uh, summers in the valley. Um, carrots and beets are good ones to start with. If you're working with young, young people, um, children, uh, grandchildren, whatever, radishes are wonderful because they grow quickly and um, if they're thin, they're fun to pull out. And there are so many, lots of varieties of radishes. I don't know if any of you have seen the, um, I think they're called Easter radishes and they're in different colors. They're just charming. And you know, that would be a fun thing for a, a young person who you'd like to interest in uh, gardening. Squash, they're the summer squash. You can get the bush style or you can get the ones that also need a lot of room to run. Uh, cucumbers, one of my personal favorites. We'll talk more about that. As you can see, there's just so many wonderful things, I think, but I'm almost a vegetarian. Um, the planning time met matters. Um, remember the cool and the warm, warm season. Uh, why do we grow so many tomatoes in this valley? 
Well, we have the right conditions for them. Why don't we grow um, artichokes like they do over in Monterey County? Because we don't have the growing season. We don't have the right temperatures. You can grow artichokes here, but we don't do it commercially. Now you can have them in your yard, sure, but they're not going to be a commercial thing. So radishes, not the heat. Um, lettuce, leaf lettuce, not the heat. Corn, not the cold. Corn likes that hot weather too. And again, remember, you've got to plant it in rows so they can pollinate each other. And everyone's going to get, oh, there we go. Going to go, hold on real quick. Oh, where are we going? Um, okay. So, and you're going to get a little chart that shows when the best time to plant. That'll be coming with everything else. Correct, Ann? Okay. All right. Now, what's your favorite vegetable? Type it into the chat room. And okay. Or your top three that you can't live without that you are going to add to your garden or find someone who grows them so that you can eat off of their garden. So take a I few thought minutes. I heard your dogs uh, say uh, their favorite sorry. was zucchini. Yeah, well, well, no, she, she likes zucchini. What can I say? The, the Chowini likes zucchini, okay? Okay, we've got, got some people coming in. Okay, snap peas, cucumbers, and tomatoes. I'm with you. Cucumbers and beets. Oh, sounds wonderful. Eggplant, tomatoes, ah, peppers, cucumber, beets. Sounds good. There's zucchini, beans, squash, tomato. Isn't that just, it's, I'm not going to ask if anyone, that, is there anyone in the group that doesn't like these vegetables, but it's just cherry tomatoes. Oh, yeah. Love them, love them, love them. Tomatoes, beets, and carrots. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. I mean, do we go on to move to tomatoes? Okay. Most popular vegetable, or is it a fruit? Can I bounce? I'm going to bounce to another slide because this is sure. incredible that tomatoes made it to the Supreme Court. Yes. A tomato, and this is one of my favorite garden stories. And I'm sorry, Ann, I'm, I'm messing up your Oh, thing. I should have put that slide in here. But you've got it. I mean, I've got it. I do? Keep going. One Where more. is it? One more. Aha. Aha. <laughs> I okay. did put it in here. Okay. Yes. Okay. I love this story. In 1890, and this is true, 1893, there was a case of Nix versus Hedden. And Mr. Nix was an importer, and he brought... Um, Okay, he brought fruit in from um, Florida and uh, uh, the Caribbean islands into New York City, New Jersey, New York. And New York City, New York State had a tax on vegetables to, because they grow vegetables in New York State and New Jersey. And I guess he didn't want, you know, other ones brought in. This would keep away, keep them out. So he, they tried to tax this, this poor importer. And he said, no, 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 tomatoes are a fruit. You can't, I, I don't need to pay the vegetable tax. A tomato is not a vegetable. So it actually went as far as the Supreme Court. And they came down with, in their infinite wisdom, give or take, that yes, tomatoes are a fruit, but we consider them a vegetable. So sorry, you have to pay the tax. I love that story. Anyway, okay, moving back. Sorry about that, but I just, I just think that's a great one. Tomatoes, is it a fruit or a vegetable? You, we know what it is for in, in the botany, but you know how we treat it. Um, there are hundreds of varieties. And um, like I said, you may want to uh, try some different varieties that you can't find in the big box stores or in your local nursery. So this is, you know, or if your first year, maybe you don't want to just use transplants. Okay, pollination. Someone asked why their fruits, vegetables were not producing. Chances are it has to do with, there are many different reasons, but pollination is a big one. Um, and when you have vegetables, they need to be pollinated. Squash, cucumbers, tomatoes, and that's done through the air, through bees, sometimes within the, its own plant. Cucumbers will pollinate themselves. Um, it's, and that's why we also care for our bees and uh, worry about the honeybee 
having the diseases and everything else, you could possibly not have fruit set because of pollination. There are several other things and um, that's a good thing for you to maybe go to your master gardener. It could possibly be from a, a lack of nutrient in the soil. Um, it could be you don't have enough sunshine on the plant, you know, needs so many hours, um, consistent water. There are lots of reasons why it hasn't set, but the big one is pollination, I think. Want to add anything, Ted, Anne? No, pollination, okay. I agree. Okay, all right. So um, I think I'm... I think I've messed up my, my script here, sorry. Um, okay, uh, tomato container gardening, which Ted touched on nicely, but the in, indeterminate tomatoes, they grow too large. But I just read an article today and it, it reinforces what I, I believed for years and years, trim your indeterminate tomatoes, prune them because they will keep growing and they will, I have, my tomatoes have outgrown the cages. So keep them pruned uh, because they're going to be for a long season and they're going to give you a constant supply. Uh, the indeterminate are, are uh, the determinate ones are good if you like to can. Um, one of our master gardeners has a huge garden and he does a lot of the determinant because he has a friend who likes to can. And so, you know, you don't wanna do one quart a week. You wanna do them all at one time. So he grows a lot of the determinant. So then he gives them to his friend so that she can can all the tomatoes or make the tomato paste or sauce or whatever it is. Oh, real quickly, a little, little thing. Um, if you have too many tomatoes in your, in your indeterminate, uh, too many cherries, too many whatever, and you think, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with these, and I, I don't want to can. Try roasting them, put a little bit of olive oil on it, put it in your oven. It doesn't have to be high heat until uh, it gets nice and gooey and maybe even a little bit dark. Scrape it off, put it into a, a sealing, sealing bag, put it in your freezer because they'll go real small, and in the winter time, you can just break off a chunk, and it's great flavor. Okay, I thought I would just throw that one in. Um, let's see, just remember with your, if you're going to do containers, tomatoes and containers, make certain you have holes in it, please. And, um, we're going to do planting the leggy tomato. All right. If you pick them up, okay, either at home, you let them grow and, oh my gosh, look at that thing. What am I going to do with it? You see, it's real simple. You don't want to cut off the top because remember we need those leaves. That's what that's going to feed the plant and make those roots grow. But take off several inches down below on your stem very carefully because they are tender. In fact, it's a good idea to use very small snips and rather than try to pinch them off or tear them off. Put that into the ground. Every place you take a stem off will become a root and that'll make a very healthy root system quicker. Um, and again, that look at the, the root ball. If it needs to be broken up a little bit and I need easily moved apart, that's also something you can do. So, tomato questions, Ted? Okay, I, I see a few here in our question, I mean, our chat department. Uh, one of them is, how do you prune tomatoes? This has happened to me. Well, what you can do is you can cut off, I don't know if you know what a sucker looks like, where the leaf comes out, there'll be a little sucker comes out right where the leaf comes out. You wanna break those out to start with because that'll take off and end up growing to the neighbors or wherever. So you want, that's part of the pruning. You can also take and cut part of the top off. If it gets real tall, you can cut a few inches of it off and it'll put out new plants on either side and then those will keep it shorter so that you don't have to, uh, uh, it, it won't grow so tall out of your uh, tomato basket or tomato cage. Uh, someone says, do you have to move indeterminate tomatoes indoors when it's cooler? Uh, you should not have to move them in only because you can grow tomatoes again next year. So I'm assuming whenever it starts to freeze, 
and the plants begin to die back, you're asking, should we, should you move them inside? I would not, you can, if, and in fact, if you wanted to, you could cut a big part of the tops off as long as the bottom is still green and then move them inside. But here again, all you have to do is just plant a new plant whenever it gets spring again. So I would not necessarily move them around. That's, that seems like a lot of work, especially because the indeterminates are maybe, you know, six or eight feet tall. So that's gonna be quite a bit to try to move around. Yeah, tomatoes are usually considered annuals. Yes. So, yeah, I'm wondering you know. if um, the person asking that question meant like they started them now, but maybe not. Oh, to have tomatoes in the winter. Okay, yeah. So like um, the time I had tomatoes that went until October, November, there was one year where it was just like the most amazing tomato year. I don't, there, there really wouldn't have been a way to bring them inside at that point. They're in the ground. Uh, yeah, I just think, unfortunately, you almost what need you your own greenhouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. What you can do is you can pick up all, pick all the green tomatoes off and pack them in newspapers or something and put them in a fairly cool place and they will ripen slowly so that you'll have tomatoes, you know, especially if the frost comes and burns and starts to burning the leaves off, you can pick all the green tomatoes off, either eat them as green tomatoes or let them slowly ripen. So. Yeah, I was talking to uh, one of our former advisors about that and they, in order for them to turn red, they somehow, they still need to be ripe when you pick them, even though they're green. Yeah. Yes, they and, have, yeah, they have to have a little shiny, skin on the outside they can't be perfectly green but once they turn start turning shiny because whenever you get tomatoes in the grocery store those are picked green they are picked like a green softball and then they put ethylene gas on them and that makes them turn red by the exactly. time they get to the store because if you pick a ripe tomato and try to box it into a box and put it on a train and get it to our truck and get it to the store, it's going to be tomato paste. So if what yeah. they have to do is they have to buy them, I mean, pick them green, and then they ripen up with ethylene yeah, gas. Yeah, they've made sure they're ripe ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So what you could do is, you know, once it gets cooler, you hope they're ripe, pick them all. If they don't turn red, make fried green tomatoes, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Or my mother used to make pickle lily with it. Oh, or there you go. Pickle them. Pickle lily or pickled tomatoes. Yeah. Delicious. It looked like there was another question from Deanna. What to do to increase pollination odds? Uh, I think, it. yeah, it wouldn't hurt to have uh, some pollinator plants around. Um, we're, and I think the question is, well, the issue is, were you not getting a lot of tomatoes? And was it a pollination problem? Was it something else? There can be weather issues. There's a lot. Again, I think I'm just going to refer everybody to watch Tips for Terrific Tomatoes. Probably better move on. We're at 7 o'clock. I'm not sure how many slides we've got left. Not yeah. Bad. Okay, now we're going to corn. Corn is wind pollinated, meaning that bees do not carry the pollen from plant to plant. What happens is the wind blows the pollen and the pollen falls down on a the silks, as you can see in the picture on the screen, that's called silks. That's where the, the, the pollen lands on each one of those little hairs and goes down into the, the uh, underneath the uh, green part you see there and pollinizes a kernel of corn. So that's the way corn is pollinated. So you want to plant the, the seed in rows because if you don't plant them in rows, then the wind cannot blow from you know the right hand side and put the pollen onto the left hand side or whichever way the wind blows. So you want to plant them in rows. Uh, the corn will be ready whenever the silks, as you can see there in the picture, these are not ready because they're still damp. They're still yellow. They will turn dark brown. And 
if you feel at the end, you should feel that the corn kernels are under there. Uh, to prevent corn earworms, you want to apply three to five drops of mineral oil to each silk just as it begins to form because the worms get in there, the uh, corn earworms gets in at the uh, tassels and goes in and eats as everybody I imagine has seen one if they've grown corn themselves. When you pull back the husk on the corn, there'll be a little spot where they, the earworm, I mean, ear corn, yes, corn earworm has eaten some of the kernels. Okay, now we're gonna talk about squash. Summer squash and winter squash are two different kinds of squash. Summer squash, like you see on the left, or zucchini, uh, yellow crook neck, straight neck, all those kind of squashes are uh, yeah, the summer squash. They have very thin skins. You eat them, they never get hard. They just, you know, grow bigger and bigger. And the winter squash is the ones that has very thick skins. The picture I sh think shows here is some uh, spaghetti squash that has a real tough skin on the outside. And they will last almost through the whole winter. That's why they call them winter squash. You want to leave them on the vine until they get hard. The vine starts dying away. And then you can harvest them and store them out of, out of the weather. Uh, banana squash, uh, in, in this case, like I said, I think those are spaghetti squash. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, those kind of things, butternut squash, those are all winter type squashes. Okay, summer squashes here, it says zucchini, yellow crookneck, patty pan. And those kinds of squashes, like I said, are the summer squashes. You harvest them at the, when they're the desired size. You don't let them get too big. The, uh, some of the uh, zucchini I've seen are, you know, two foot long and six or eight inches around or so, bigger than that maybe. You could use it for a kayak, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can carve them out and make kayaks out of them, like Rose said. Uh, you can make bread and zucchini bread and stuff out of the bigger ones, but your best bet is to harvest them whenever, you know, you want to eat them, you know, when they're smaller. They need about 60 days from seed to harvest time. You can plant them in containers like this picture shows here. The container used needs to be about 24 inches wide and 18, 16 to 18 inches deep, and that'll have plenty of soil for the plant to grow. You can use Use three plants for your best pollination. <clears throat> and bush types are very good for these. The, the zucchini you see there is a bush type zucchini. It doesn't grow real long. And the vining uh, type of squash, you might need a small trellis to keep them from growing all over your patio or, or wherever you have this pot. Winter squash. Uh, here again are banana nut, uh, banana, butternut, kabacha, spaghetti squash, Hubbard squash. You can see the pictures there. There's many, many different varieties. And here again, all of these get hard on the outside like a squaw, uh, pumpkin. And you eat them by cutting them open, take the seeds out and all that kind of stuff. You plant them in the spring and then you harvest them in the fall and they'll keep for the winter. So when you, you harvest them, when the rind is hard, hardens and it turns a dull color. As you can see here, these all have, you know, different colors and shapes. Eat or cure. You store them. You can store them for five weeks or to several months in a cool, dry place. Yeah, we didn't write it here, but uh, depending on the squash, some are you can keep them longer than others, like your little. Um, acorn squash, I think those keep for like three months and then some of the other ones can keep even longer. Yeah. Yeah, the delicata don't stay long. They've got a very soft skin. In fact, you eat the whole thing. So that doesn't, even though it's a winter squash, it, it doesn't store well. Okay, now we're gonna talk about beans. There's a couple of different type beans. There's bush beans and pole beans. Bush beans, will grow uh, in 
make a little round bush. That's why they're called bush beans. And you pick the beans off of them and they never grow into a long uh, vine-like thing. But the, the pole beans are the ones that grow vines that you know twine around themselves and you, you need some kind of support to keep them up because if you don't, they'll lay down on the ground and you'll miss some of the seed, the beans that you want instead of harvesting them. You, can, you want to use a two gallon sized pot or so per plant if you want to plant them in pots. Uh, you harvest them, you gently snap them off the plants and they're easy to pick. You just snap them off and enjoy them. Beets, lettuce and carrots. These things are best planted in February or March. You don't want to, uh, don't forget to thin them because if you don't, you'll end up with a whole bunch of baby carrots that are real thin. Uh, you want to use a one gallon container or larger if you want to have radishes or carrots or lettuce in containers. And you harvest them in the late spring. If you don't, they'll bolt as soon as it starts getting, you know, real warm up into the, you know, 90s, they'll take off and put seed stalks up. Cucumbers. Cucumbers are here again, are either in the either in the pole or the bush type. And uh, they will, you need to support, provide support for the pole cucumber because they will grow and, and continue to grow in a lawn like the, the beans that do. Uh, you want, here again, you want to have at least three plants because the way these, these cucumbers, squash and things like that pollenize is you have a male and a female flower. And so if you have two plant, three plants, then there's bound to be a male on one of them and females on the other ones if they're not on the same plant. So your, your best bet is to have three plants for best pollinization. You want to use a two gallon size or bigger for your pot. And some of the ones that are bush type are uh, Space Master, Bush Crop, and Bush Champion, and Patio Pickle, and Save Space. Now we're going to talk about eggplant. Is there any eggplant lovers out there? Uh, I always have to put that since I like them so much. Yes. Yay, look, there's Ro. Type in the chat if you love eggplant. Because your grandma made you eat them forever until you decided you liked them. Ah, yeah. OK. Uh, eggplant, you almost have to have a pair of pruners to cut them because of the uh, some of them have a little spurs on the uh, the green part. But you can see uh, in the picture on the, uh, the top where the blue one, uh, excuse me, the white eggplant is. They have little spurs on there and they can, you know, they're awfully tough. So you need a pair of hand pruners to get them off. You want to use them immediately or you can store them on a countertop. Don't put them in the refrigerator necessarily, but they will last a, a day or so in the, on the countertop. And you need to plant them in a five gallon container like the tomatoes, they grow fairly large. I put mine in a cage. They get so big. Yeah. I yes. use a support for them because that's just easier to contain them and not have them flopping over once you start getting some big fruit on them. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to talk about peppers. Peppers are easy to get sunburned, as you can see from the right hand side bottom picture. That's a, uh, a sunburn spot on there. Um, you You need to have leaves on there to keep them, you know, from getting too sunburned. Uh, large pepper plants can benefit from having a cage to hold them up and keep the leaves where they don't all fall down. Uh, they come in many different shapes, colors, can, uh, flavors. There's chili bells and banana peppers, and they all do well in a five gallon container. And they all do well in this valley. Yes, yes, this valley is very good for the peppers. Now we're going to talk about melons. Watermelons, cantaloupes, honeydews, cassava melons all prefer warm weather to get ripe. And whenever, how do you know if a watermelon is ripe? If you'll turn it over, the rind that's on the ground will turn yellow. Uh, 
you can also, if you look at the end of it where the blossom was, sometimes you can see little pieces of uh, what looks like uh, bark or something. And what it is is this, the sugar that's coming out from the blossom end. So that's another way of telling a ripe watermelon. Cantaloupes, when the fruit slips off the vine and when you reach down to roll it over to see what the bottom looks like, it comes right off, it's probably ripe. Okay, questions. Well, I wanna go back, Anne's already answered this for, um, but I think, it's, I think it's funny because I'm not involved with it, but I grew up with my father versus the squirrels. Um, Donna's saying that, um, no, I'm sorry, it's not Donna. Uh, Pam, Pamela says, the squirrels are eating your tomatoes. How do you keep that? The only thing I know is um, my father planted a walnut tree and lived in the house for I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, and never got one walnut off the tree. We had the healthiest squirrels in the county. So I love, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make fun of, of your squirrel problem, but I understand. I don't know if there's much you can do, to be honest with you. You know, you can try caging them, but they, they, they reach their little hands and they're smart little. They are very smart. I have not recently read the pest notes about them from UCIPM, but I can send that to you, Pam. And then of course, connect you with your local cooperative extension. I'm assuming if you're from around this area, you might be in Tuolumne or Calaveras or um, squirrel, country. squirrel country, <laughs> yeah. or you're dealing with ground squirrels, which can also, we do have quite a few of those around. Yeah, they're, they're, they're smart little guys. Okay. What are you going to plant in your garden this spring? Something different? Uh, did you see what Bonnie said? Squirrels planted their own. No, own no, no, I missed that one. What did she we, say? We never got a nut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, they planted the tree. Hey, they planted the tree, Bonnie. It was their tree, their walnuts. Yeah. <laughs> I understand totally. Okay. So what what are what are you gonna be growing in your garden? Is it going to be something besides your three favorites? You're gonna try something different? I know. Uh, Yesenia said she's going to do beefsteaks this year, which is very exciting because those are wonderful tomatoes. And nothing else yet. So think about it, put it in the chat. And we've got a couple more questions. Uh, do five gallon, uh, five gallon containers need to be used or they can plants be planted in an open ground? I think we might have confused uh, Dorinda oh, because sorry. we were talking about how you can plant them in the ground. Uh, I'm sorry, but you can plant them in pots. However, the ground is a great spot. So yes. Especially for sure those things that need space. Take them out of the pot. But if you live where you have a small patio, a balcony, um, your yard is used for other things, then container gardening is great. Uh, Dorinda, do I need to plant more than one cantaloupe plant like in sets of three or pepper plants as well? No, no, you do not. Cantaloupes will produce, melons will produce, pumpkins will produce um, without having the three. It just, for some reason, it seems like the cucumbers. Some of the squash, yeah, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Um, did we talk about how the issue a lot of times with cucumbers and squash and that sort of thing is that there are male flowers and female flowers and often the male flowers come out first and the bees are pollinating, but then there is no uh, female flower to take that pollen to. So you just have to wait. And it's early right now. We are giving this class in February. However, we're doing that so that you can get ready for March. And in some instances, at least we're talking in Stanislaus County, you can plant your tomatoes as early as, you know, the second or third week in March or as late as April or even May um, and still keep getting tomatoes. So um, sometimes with, with certain plants, you just have to wait until uh, the pollination happens. And you'll even see the female uh, 
part of the cucumber looked like, you know, oh, I'm going to get a fruit, but it actually wasn't pollinated. And then it just shrivels up and dies. Yeah. So yeah. it's not your fault. It's just timing. Yeah. Okay. Alexandra has a, a problem with her raised garden bed. She has cats in the neighborhood or in her home that use it in the litter box, which, mm. is, which is a problem. Um, your, your soil is, is not good anymore. If, yeah, if I would say you've got to find a way to exclude them and keep them from um, getting in. I don't know if you could build something around it to prevent them. Or screen on top so that they can't oh, that's, get into the Yeah, soil. yeah, which is tricky. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great idea, Ro, because then they wouldn't be able to get in there before you start planting. Yeah. Um, although once you start planting, you know, then they're like, oh, look, here's this new area. Except uh, if they keep it damp, they won't, like. they don't like that. They won't yeah, go that, in That's there. not a bad idea. Yeah. So, All right. No. The main thing is doing something to prevent them from digging. Um, I've known, you know, this is anything you put in there that they can't you know makes it impossible for them to dig then it would not be such a lovely spot yeah good luck with that one yeah i'm sorry yeah yeah um cucumbers you have to keep picking the fruit if you want more fruit if you leave them says sorry you know sorry that's not a problem around here i'm out there picking those cucumbers all the time i love them so yes thank you that's a good good point yeah, but, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I think what she means is maybe if you leave it, uh, they'll probably get bigger and bigger, and then you won't get as much fruit, maybe, or energy going to the other fruits. So, yeah, it's good to pick them on time. Yeah. And when they're, they're tender, they just taste better. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Stephanie was saying kind of what you were saying, Ro, cover the beds with chicken wire, because then, yeah. you know, they can't, they can't get in there and dig. Yeah. Yeah, interestingly enough, there's not a pest notes about cats. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> told me that uh, someone once asked UCIPM if they would do a pest notes on in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they replied, well, let's see. A lot of the things that we already say about pests would work. You know, um, make sure you don't have any holes in your screen. So they can't come in the door, uh, you know, I guess there aren't any things about locking doors, but yes, um, exclusion is, is the best practice, at least for some of these. Okay, um, Alexandra, I would say definitely you need to get rid of that soil. Ooh, you don't yes. know what microbes are in there or how clean or dirty it actually guess, is. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point, Ro. Um, Plus the fact that if it's already been used, other cats will try to use it because yeah, yeah. I would I would try to get rid of some of that and do the third mix with your potting soil and your compost and they probably didn't dig super deep, but yeah, just remove it to the best of your ability. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, a lot All of good right. ideas. Uh, but people are going to plant. Uh, someone, I think Sori said she's going to do sh shard. Remember, that takes cooler weather. So, you know, you want to make certain that you get that in the ground. Soon. Know, March, April, so that you can harvest it before. Yeah, it we, we have uh, in our little master gardener garden, we have chard that we planted in fall. But um, you can plant it now, too. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, and everyone's gonna get a copy of storage tips um, in your email. You can see the best way to store your fruits and vegetables in case you have questions. I think the number one is tomatoes don't like the refrigeration. So you pick the tomato and you eat it quickly or you leave it out on the counter, windowsill for a day or two, stem down. And, but they're, they're sensitive once they get picked so just plan on if you're going to grow tomatoes, you're going to eat a lot of tomatoes or give them for gifts. Okay, well, we've kind of... I think uh, 
I might have already jumped ahead, but it doesn't hurt to no. have uh, Ted go over this stuff. I know sometimes during classes, someone will ask a question and I'll think, I think I did that slide, but there's so much information. It's always good to hear it twice. And for some people, it might only be the first time because it's a lot of information. Yeah, here, here is some of the, uh, we were talking about the, the two flowers on uh, cucumbers and squash plants. As you can see, the one on the, the left in this small picture is a male plant, male flower. And the one on the right with the little baby cucumber is the female flower. And they come out at different times. The males come out first. So the bees have, are attracted to the pollen that the, that the males have. And if there's no female flowers, and this is another reason that you have uh, more than one plant of the same kind, that way the, the bees have a better option of you know, finding a female flower on the same, on either plants that you have planted. So some fruit may shrivel up and, 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 and on the very end, usually what it is, it'll start growing like the picture you see here. And then after the flower blossom falls off, and then it'll all of a sudden it'll turn a little brown and black on the end. That it happens a lot in squash as well as the cucumbers whenever they don't get pollinized. And it's uh, a killer, especially in the beginning. Yes. You, just, it, you go it, out and that, that new plant and you've got that little baby and it's dying. You go, oh no, I'm not gonna have the cucumbers. Yes, and then you also say, is this gonna happen to all of them? I'm gonna lose my, you know, anyway. So yeah. just just be patient, it'll it'll work. Um, blossom end rot. This happens in tomato squash and peppers. It's uh, due to a water imbalance. If you don't water regularly, uh, it, it gets this thing. I know I've seen them on my tomato plants like that and the, uh, the, the squash as you see in this picture too. Uh, water regularly to keep the soil moisture but not too wet adding fertilizer will not help this is not a fertilizer problem this is a uh, problem with the way you water if you oh, if you don't water them regularly this might happen to you tomato hornworm anybody that grows tomatoes have seen those big old big as your finger or your thumb green tomatoes with a horn on its tail Everybody's seen those. Uh, another one, I, I don't know, I mean, I've seen them, but I don't know if many people have seen them. The leaf-footed bugs that you have right there, mm -hmm. picture in the middle. Uh, aphids, everybody that has flowers or roses or you know vegetable gardens has a chance of getting aphids. Aphids come in all different colors, and so they're uh, usually on the underside of the leaf or on the stems. Uh, then at the bottom, you'll see a picture of the uh, corn earworm yeah. eating the kernels of corn. Uh, you can wash off aphids and uh, other bugs, or you can knock them into a bottle, bucket of hot water. All those things work. You can squish the bigger ones. The, the uh, green horn, I mean, a tomato hornworm, if you have those and you have chickens, they love them. <laughs> Don't mean your chicken fan, they'll eat the heck out of them. Yeah. Any questions? There's just a few more. Uh, Donna wanted to know if we get an email, a copy of the slides used in this presentation. Uh, yes, you will. Right, Anne? Yes. Everybody yes. should have already gotten one. It should be attached to the email I sent. Uh, but we will i will send it again out in case it didn't go through okay and that's that's about it so no other questions all right i if you're think not in stanislaus county contact your local program um, because they know more about the growing situation in your area and um Ted's going to talk a little bit now about the uh, UCIPM, which is a wealth of information. And I imagine you'll want to star that and put it on your, your, your number one list. Yes, if you, if you have a uh, iPad or a uh, computer, 
keep this as a bookmark because you're 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 bound to be uh, sometime when you're going to need it. You're, if you have insects or whatever in in your garden, this is a very good source. The IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management Program. So, and it's brought to you by the University of California. So, uh, as you can see, if you have home garden turf or landscape pests, you click right there and it'll bring you up to this next page. And then this page, you can pick on whether it's a flower or a garden pro item, you know, whatever it is. And you click on that and it'll tell you that, uh, you know, what pests you might find and it'll describe what damage they do. And that way you can find out whether it's a, you know, a chewing insect or a whatever sucking insect. And they'll have you uh, ways of getting relief from their problems that you have with yep. these insects. Wonderful source. Right here, it shows you that, uh, you know, like I said, once you get to the to the second page, after you click on your garden, you'll see that it says vegetables and melons, or it says trees and shrubs, lawns and turf and things like that. So you can click on that little link and that'll take you to a list of all of the different kinds of things like artichokes and asparagus and you know all of those different things that you might have problems with. You go down that list and you find which plant that you might have a problem with. Uh, in this case, we went to vegetables and melons. So you let, you know, we just click on one of these and, and it'll take you to what kind of pests there might find on your tomatoes or on your pumpkins or whatever. And it'll give you some helpful hints on how to control them. Yep. And it looks like everyone's either asleep or we've answered all the questions. <laughs> yes, I think we've... we've uh, I don't we've, think they're asleep. I think Ted and Ro did an amazing job and sadly, we can't hear the applause from the folks at home, uh, but I think they would be applauding you for this great information. And... Well, um, this has been a great group. They did lots of questions and lots of information yeah. from them. I love it. Yes, lots yes, yes. I, I agree. We had, we had some good questions. I agree. Really good questions. Thanks, yeah. everybody. I see there's some typing in the chat going on. Oh, it's oh, a Okay. <laughs> and Anne? Yes. We'll be sending out in a few months, right? Questionnaire. A questionnaire? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, we have one more slide. Yes. Oh, wait for yes, it. Yes, we do. In three months when you've forgotten all Hello, about Anne. this. I thought you were talking about, I was like, I'm going to send them all some stuff tomorrow. But yes, no, uh, their emails will go out uh, to the statewide program, which will send you a question about vegetables and then probably about pests and what did you learn from our class. And that helps us improve our program and um, shows that we are helping the public and uh, helping you answer your questions. And so you can grow your delicious uh, vegetables at home. And uh, next month, we are going to be doing a class on citrus. So stay tuned, more information about that. And uh, I don't know, I see there's more in the Q&A. Oh, oh, um, um, let me go. Let me go. Sorry. I'm typing a. Oh, they're actually comments. Dorinda oh. said, thank you. Alexandra has a three month old and is excited to provide homegrown foods. Good that is for so you. sweet. Excellent. We love to hear that kind of thing. Excellent. So, yes. Yes. I know uh, my 